The second question that we addressed today is on a completely different subject, but one that inevitably is very important for all of us. It has to do with health. Also on the subject of seeking instruction in the Bible. Does the Bible give guidance on seeking medical help or undergoing medical procedures? In Numbers, we read about the curing of Miriam's leprosy when Moses prays to God for her. Is this the first case of faith healing? How do Jews, based upon the Bible, view donating blood for transfusions and donating organs for transplants? I deliberately read all these questions together because obviously they all pertain to healing, and I think it's instructive to consider in attempting to respond to them what healing signifies in the Bible. The root for healing in Biblical Hebrew is rafo, that is for the Hebraicists among you, resh, pe, aleph, are the root letters. And this root appears for the first time in the Bible in Genesis chapter 20 in verses 17 and 18. The context here is after Abimelech, king of the Philistines, had taken Sarah, Abraham's wife, and was by consequence smitten together with his household by God and warned of the dire consequences of not releasing her, he releases her. And then we read, so Abraham prayed to God. And God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bore. Their orifices opened, they bore children. For God had fast closed up all the wombs, again, perhaps we should read this as all the orifices of the house of Abimelech, because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Well, of course, we emphasize, this is the first place that healing appears in the Bible, and who is doing the healing? Of course, the one doing the healing is God. And in much this vein, I'm going to deliberately skip to the third place that healing appears in the Bible, before we go back to the second. In the third place, we encounter the noun form, not merely healing, but healer, rofe, which could also be rendered as physician, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. We read the following proposition by God to Israel. If you will diligently hearken to the voice of God your Lord, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you that I have put upon Egypt, for I am God your healer. So here we encounter, again, the noun. And again, it's talking about God. God is the one who bestows healing. But again, I reiterate, I conveniently skipped the second place where healing appears in Scripture. And here's also a noun. Healers or physicians. And here it's talking about people. I just, I feel compelled to stress at the outset the kind of healers or physicians about whom we read in Genesis chapter 50, verse 2, are not the kind of healers you would ever want to encounter in your lives. After the death of Jacob, we read, And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. So, 
people are engaging in a healing process, again, not what we would call healing because it's not keeping a person alive, it's keeping a dead body from decomposing. Well, I suppose we can see that as part of the same broader engagement as what we would describe as physicians, that is preventing what would otherwise happen if we let nature take its course. With someone who is alive but ill, if we sit back and let nature take its course, he can die. With someone who's dead, if we let nature take its course, the body will decompose. So, here the physician's role is to prevent decomposition. Obviously, elsewhere, the physician's role is to restore health. And that brings me critically to the fourth place in the Bible where we encounter healing. The fourth place is especially important because it appears in a legal context. In Exodus chapter 21, we read the law with respect to an assailant who has caused bodily injury to his victim. In verses 18 and 19, again in Exodus chapter 21, and if men strive together, and one smites another with a stone or with his fist, and the victim doesn't die, but keeps his bed, he is confined to bed, in other words, he suffers bodily injury, if he rises again and walks abroad upon his staff, then shall he that struck him be acquitted be acquitted, obviously, because if the victim does not recover from the blow, then the assailant is a murderer. But again, if the victim recovers well enough to be able to walk about, then the assailant didn't kill him, he just injured him. So he is acquitted of the charge of murder, but only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. The loss of time, meaning he needs to pay compensation for the lost work time of the victim. Obviously, he wasn't able to work when he was convalescing from his injury. And, and this is of course critical for our purposes, to ensure that he is thoroughly healed, in other words, practically, to pay all medical expenses. Well, obviously, if you're paying medical expenses, that means that you have practitioners of medicine who need to be paid for their time, for their efforts, for the medical procedures in which they engage in order to secure the renewed health of the victim. And of course, what is glaringly obvious in this prescription of the law is the assailant cannot say, oh, I'll pray for him and he'll get all better. Doesn't work that way. He's certainly welcome to pay for his victim, to pray for the victim's recovery. He's also to pay for all the medical procedures that are incurred in order to provide the healing. And in our tradition, indeed, this statement in scripture provides us with the source for doctors, physicians, practicing their craft. Now, we should note here, one could conceivably argue, well, maybe this is only when a person was injured because of the assault of another person. That under such circumstances, the assailant has to cover the medical expenses because he was the one who caused the injury. But what if the ailment was caused by God. There wasn't any human agent. One might conceivably posit that if the source of the ailment is God, then the source of the healing should be in God. We shouldn't get involved. One might, but we don't. That is, this mandate to provide for the complete healing of the victim is taken as 
a mandate for the physician to engage in his craft. And after all, we read in the Torah the precept of the mitzvah of restoring a lost article to the person who lost it. What could be a more worthy, laudable way of fulfilling that precept of returning a lost article than returning to a person his or her lost health? So the physician is indeed not only licensed, but required to engage in his or her craft in healing the ill. Now, this having been stated, we should note that, again, conceivably, one might argue that we should defer to God on this score and let God choose to heal whom he deems worthy of being healed. I feel compelled to share with you an instructive observation that is expressed by one of the great sages of the medieval period, whom we have quoted on many occasions in the past, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, who, I should note, was himself a noted physician. He comments rhetorically with respect to someone who might claim you should leave the healing to God. Would we then say that if a person is suffering from the illness of hunger, which is definitely an illness. Not only that, it can be fatal if a person doesn't eat. Shall we say he should just wait for God to feed him? And if he goes and procures food for himself, then he has shunned God and ceased to look to God for his salvation? Answers the rabbi, of course not. Rather, when he seeks the food to sustain himself, he thanks God. Indeed, every time we eat anything, we thank God. We say blessings of thanks to God for having provided us with that sustenance. He thanks God for having provided him with the means to ameliorate his hunger. He doesn't sit back and wait for God to fill his mouth. The same thing is true with disease. God bids us to be proactive. Arguably, it would be far, far easier, on the one hand, to tell us, forget about God and just do everything on your own, or, on the other hand, to tell us, don't do anything on your own, just wait for God's salvation. Well, at least conceptually, it would be easier. But what the Bible demands of us with these words, to provide for the healing of the one who is ailing is the mandate on the one hand to entirely trust in God, to remember the first place that healing appears in Scripture, God is the one providing the healing. And arguably, that, rather than what we read in Numbers chapter 10, could be seen as the first instance of faith healing. Abraham prays for Avimelech and his family, and they are cured. Because ultimately, the healing does come from God. In that instance, since the malady was entirely miraculous from God, the healing came exclusively through prayer. The rest of the time, we indeed trust in God for our healing, but simultaneously, we expend all of our efforts to make ourselves worthy receptacles of God's grace in being healed by taking the medicine, by engaging in the medical procedures, and all the time praying, God, may this thing that I am doing, may this medicine that I am consuming be the healing that comes from you. Because all healing, ultimately, after all, comes exclusively from God. So there is this relentless tension. We strive to heal all those who are ailing, even as we believe that 
in the final analysis that healing comes from God. And maybe that helps to inform our understanding of one additional verse that I feel compelled to share with you from the second book of Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 12, describing King Asa of Judah. And Asa, in the 39th year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease became severe. And here we get the words of rebuke. Yet in his disease, he did not seek God, but the physicians. Now, what exactly are we to make of what seems to be a dual indictment? He didn't seek God, and he did seek the physicians. On the one hand, one way of looking at that is, there wouldn't be anything fundamentally wrong about seeking the physicians if he sought God first. Again, you seek God even as you turn to physician, because even as you engage in whatever medical procedures the physicians prescribe, you trust that the one who is ultimately the source of your healing is God. To that extent, the indictment is, you went to the physicians and you didn't seek God as well. That's one way of looking at it. On the other hand, there are those who posit that if an individual is at a sufficiently exalted spiritual level, if he is so intimately bonded with God, that he should only seek God's healing and shouldn't turn to physicians at all. Could be. But simultaneously, it's important for us to stress that doesn't apply nowadays to the vast majority of humanity. For all the rest of us who are under such a sublime level of holiness, we are not only licensed but required to seek medical help whenever something is ailing to us. Even as, again, we always trust that the final healing is something that comes from God. So, with respect to the questions here, now that we've seen the background in the Bible, on the one hand, of course, does the Bible give guidance on seeking medical help or undergoing medical procedures? The answer is emphatically yes. Most emphatically, again, Exodus chapter 21, verse 19, to take care of the healing, to see the procurement of medical help as not only permissible, but an obligation. And of course, in that vein, with respect to the curing of Miriam's leprosy when Moses praised God for her, I feel compelled to make the same point that I made with respect to Abraham praying to God in what might be deemed the first instance of faith healing in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 20. All that is involved in that healing is a prayer because the malady, the affliction, was entirely miraculous. In the case of Avimelech and his household in Genesis chapter 20, we already noted. In the case of Miriam, her being smitten by, I prefer to use the Hebrew, Sarat, is as punishment for her having spoken inappropriately of her brother Moses. Leprosy is a poor translation, an artifact of the translations of the Torah into Greek and Latin. Sarat, certainly as it pertained to Miriam, is a spiritual affliction. It was indeed a miraculous affliction that was brought upon Miriam as punishment by God. So of course, under the circumstances, the only way to ameliorate that affliction is by turning to God in prayer. But wherever the malady has more mundane, prosaic origins. While we certainly pray to God for healing, we are certainly not absolved of the responsibility to seek medical help as well. And this brings me to the final component of the question with which we need to conclude. How do Jews, based upon the Bible, view donating blood for transfusions and donating organs for transplants? 
Well, based upon what we've seen thus far, with respect to the obligation that the Bible places upon us to do our best to heal those who are ailing, just as the Bible bids us altogether, in general, to engage in the works that will make this world a better place, to struggle to refine and ultimately perfect this world under the reign of the Almighty, so too here. There is no greater gift that we can give one another than the gift of life. To the extent that donating blood or donating organs is something that we can undertake in our lives to save the lives of others, it is undoubtedly, from the perspective of the Bible, a great mitzvah, a great good deed that we are bidden to strive to do as best we can. That's dated. Of course, we recognize that a healthy adult can donate blood without endangering his or her own life. Likewise, there are certain organ transplants that can be undertaken relatively in safety as well. Donating one of our kidneys, donating bone marrow, donating a portion of our livers, that is to the extent that we'll be able to continue living afterwards. Because while doing our utmost to save others is unquestionably the greatest gift, we are forbidden to take our own lives, even for a worthy cause, if there aren't specific guidelines that mandate doing so. There are certain circumstances that demand of us martyrdom, but this is certainly not one of them. On the contrary, one of the circumstances that mandates martyrdom in our tradition is if you are held captive and told either you kill so-and-so or will kill you. No one has the right to play God and choose who will live and who will die. We don't take our own lives, but we will submit to martyrdom in order to avoid a violation of the prohibition of murder. Likewise, reversing the question, one is not permitted to forfeit one's own life in order to save another by offering one's organs for transplant if the consequence will be death. And inevitably, this question does arise in all of its complexities, its ferocious complexities, when we consider the question of organ transplant with respect to those organs without which no one can survive. Again, you can donate a kidney and live. You can donate bone marrow and live. You can even donate part of your liver and live. You cannot donate your heart and live. Only the recipient will, if all goes well, survive that procedure. The donor will not. Which inevitably forces us to confront the thorny question of when does life end? Now, this is a very complex issue, and I am not going to make any attempt whatsoever to resolve it here. It is a question for the most dedicated students of the Bible and the biblical law to deliberate over and to reach the appropriate conclusions, and it's by no means a simple question. If the donor is deemed to be already deceased, in which case you can't save the donor's life anyway, then transplanting his organs is again the greatest mitzvah, saving a life, the greatest good deed, saving the lives of the recipients of those organs that will be transplanted. 
If, however, the donor is deemed to still be alive, even if the donor only has a few hours of life left, taking out the donor's heart, killing him, is an act of murder. To the extent that you are at all familiar with the question of organ donation in Jewish tradition, this is the crux of the question. Again, we strive to our utmost to be godly. God reveals himself to us by acts of giving, and we strive likewise to give as much as we can. Giving the gift of life is the greatest gift of all. But while striving to be godly, we don't attempt to play God, to decide who shall live and who shall die. So again, the critical question, is the donor already dead? If so, you're not saving a life anyway by refraining from engaging in the transplant. You can only save lives by taking the organs of the deceased donor and transplanting them into living people. But if the donor is still alive, we are emphatically not utilitarians. We don't gauge the value of life in quantitative terms. We don't say, well, the recipient has the potential to live decades. The donor will be dead in a matter of hours. That's not our decision to make. That's placing a value on human life. That is the ultimate travesty. Indeed, in our tradition, if an enemy takes a number of people captive and says, okay, choose among yourselves, give us a victim and we'll kill him. And if you don't choose a victim, we'll kill all of you. What's the verdict? We're not choosing a victim even if the consequence is that all of them will be put to death. We don't play God ever. If we would, consider. You have an array of patients. One needs a heart transplant. Two need lung transplants. Two others need kidney transplants. Can you take a perfectly healthy person, kill him in order to harvest his organs? After all, just one person died, and you saved five. You can save even more than five. No. That's an act of murder, and it will never be condoned. Again, we strive to be godly. We do not strive to play God. That's the critical distinction that needs to be drawn. It is giving of ourselves to the full extent that we can but not succumbing to a utilitarian view where we deem one life valuable and another life not. This is the challenge. It's a challenge, I submit, that on manifold planes applies throughout our lives. Maybe most graphically for the physicians, but really in various contexts to all of us. Strive with all our hearts and souls to be godly and to be godly dispensers, giving as best we can, but to never strive to play God, to arrogate to ourselves an authority that we don't have. And so, again, healing the sick is the sacred responsibility that God gives us. Healing the sick is the great good deed, the mitzvah, of emulating God and being godly. It doesn't excuse playing God. May we indeed integrate godliness, true godliness, not the counterfeit brand, true godliness, into our lives in every way possible. God bless you.